our Father in heaven. Lord, we pray that we too can go with you all the way. Uh, even through the judgment that is taking place even now. We ask, Lord, that the judgment would fall in our favor. And that we would be found uh, without spot and without blemish. Nothing wanting when the final irrevocable decision goes forth. That he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Father, we pray that we fall upon the side of the righteous. We ask, dear Lord, for this to take place, that you would forgive us our sins. Collectively, dear Father, we ask, corporately we ask, that the blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse us from all sin. That you would be with us and help us to walk in the newness of life. And Father, as we have asked for that great blessing, we pray for the promise of the Father, that you would bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, that would lead us to the understanding of sacred truth, that we would understand the scriptures as we run to and fro. Guide us and bless us is our prayer this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. You're turning your Bibles to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, we're going to look together. Matthew chapter 13 and uh, verse 44. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. We're continuing, of course, in our series on the parables of Jesus called Christ's Object Lessons. We're looking at both the practical and the prophetic aspect of each parable. And um, I've been blessed as we've been walking through the parables. I've learned many things uh, studying for these parables, studying for the presentations. And I pray that you are blessed as well. And uh, this morning we're going to take a parable that is written only in the book of Matthew, only in one verse. It's not found anywhere else. Uh, this is Matthew 13 and verse 44. So when you are there in Matthew 13, verse 44, let me know by saying amen. All right, so we're in Matthew 13, verse 44. We're going to do this parable, even though it's one verse, even though it's only found in one chapter of the Gospels, it's, 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 it's full. There's much in this particular uh, scripture. So we're going to do this in a few parts, or you know, maybe two, maybe three parts. We'll see. But uh, we're going to do part one today. The Bible says in Matthew 13, verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So the Bible is identifying uh, the kingdom of God again here, the kingdom of grace, which we've understood uh, comes by way of truth as it uh, changes the life and converts the soul. We've looked at all of those things together, but the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure that is hid in a field. And so we're going to talk about those three things today. All right, what this treasure is, what is this, the field that hides the treasure, and why is it hid or how it's hidden. And so we're going to look at these things. So take out your paper. Let's put a little bit of a, a background to this parable. I love how Jesus would take the things around him as he was teaching the people. He would look and he would take the things natural or, or very conspicuous to their sight and he would use it to illustrate divine truth. And so notice what, your Bible, what the Spirit of Prophecy says, Christ's Object Lessons. This is page uh, 303 to 304. We're going to read these three paragraphs here. It says, In ancient times it was customary for men to hide their treasures in the earth. Thieves and robberies, thefts and robberies were frequent. Whenever there was a change in the ruling power, those who had large possessions were liable to be under heavy tribute. Moreover, the country was in constant danger of invasion by marauding armies. As a consequence, the rich endeavored to preserve their wealth by concealing it, and the earth was looked upon as a safe hiding place. But often the place of concealment was forgotten. Death might claim the owner, imprisonment or exile might separate him from his treasure, and the wealth that he had taken much pains to preserve was left for the uh, fortunate finder. 
In Christ's day, it was not uncommon to discover in neglected land old coins and ornaments of gold and silver. A man hires land to cultivate, and as his ox plows the field, oxen plows the field, buried treasure is unearthed. As the man discovers this treasure, he has seen that this he sees that a fortune is within his reach. Restoring the gold to its right hiding place, he returns to his home and sells all that he has in order to purchase the field containing the treasure. His family and his neighbors think that he is acting like a madman. Looking on the field, they see no value in the neglected soil, but the man knows what he is doing. And when he has the title to the field, he searches every part of it to find the treasure that he has secured. This parable illustrates the value of the heavenly treasure and the effort that should be made to secure it. The finder of the treasure in the field is re ready to part with all that he had, ready to put forth untiring labor in order to secure the hidden riches. So the finder of heavenly treasure will count no labor too great and no sacrifice too dear in order to gain the treasures of truth. And so friends, we're going to look at this particular parable together. And as you turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, we're going to look at quite a few scriptures today regarding how the truth, wisdom, knowledge, understanding is far greater than any earthly treasure. And so notice what your Bible says in the book of Proverbs. We'll start in the second chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1, then we'll go to Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll move through the book of Proverbs because the wise man, Solomon here, has much to say about this particular treasure. And so notice what your Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1. Proverbs chapter 2, what verse are we going to? Verse 1. Notice what your Bible says. It says, My son, if thou would receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as what? Silver and searcheth for her as for what? Hidden treasure or hid treasures. Then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the ways or the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. The Bible shows that if we cry after knowledge and lift up our voice for understanding, if we search for it as for hid treasure, if we cry after it, yearn for it for, as for silver, then we will obtain it. But the reason why many of God's people do not receive the blessings the truth contains is because we're a casual reader. We become surface in our understanding. And if you look at the words of Paul, I'm going to say this very, very as straight as I can say it. But when you look at the words of Paul, surface readers will be lost. Surface readers will not be saved. Because at the end of time, our only safeguard is the scriptures. And if all we have is a surface understanding, friends, we're going to be swept away. We're going to be shaken when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And we will be without footing underneath our feet. And so we need to search, we need to yearn for it, we need to agonize for this wisdom and knowledge. Look at Proverbs 3, Proverbs chapter 3. Maybe, like me, you have thought or asked God the question, Lord, why did you make it difficult? Why, do I, why can't I just start in Genesis chapter 1 and just read through the Bible like a, like a book? And then at the end, in the book of Revelation 22, I have all the understanding. Why is it that I have to connect this here and connect this there and, and pray and sometimes rack my brain to, well, I get a headache because I'm trying to understand something so deeply? Why, does, why do I have to take so much time to understand these truths? Why not just make it simple? You see, friends, because then we wouldn't value it. You know, I was talking to my children. We were talking about a, 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 the, a principle of truth, and I said, what if, what if gold was just strewn all upon the ground? 
What if you went outside and rocks were rubies and diamonds and pearls and these things were all over the earth? Would they have the value that they have today? And they said, well, no. I said, well, why not? Because it's, it's common. It's, it's just right there. And I said, right. And so when it comes to truth, there are things that are very surface. There are things that, that a casual reader can understand, such as the love of God. The, the plan of salvation. You can see that Christ died for our sins. Those are, those are some of the surface things, but the deeper understandings of truth are hidden underneath the sacred pages, and we have to dig to find it. As a matter of fact, using the words of the spirit of prophecy, I, I, I'm not re remembering if I put this particular statement in here, but she describes how the Bible contains more veins of gold in it than all the earth. You ever, you, know, you, you listen or you, you read in history about the gold rush and how they would break open a mountain and there would be like the size of a mountain, this big, you know, this, this, this vein of gold in the earth. The Bible contains more veins of gold than all the world, we're told. We'll never be able to exhaust it all. Look at what the Bible says in chapter 3 of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to verse 13. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 and verse 13, it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is every one that retaineth her. The Bible shows that wisdom is greater than rubies, greater than gold. It brings these blessings in its train. Length of days is in her right hand in verse 16. In her left hand is riches and honor. All the things that men seek for in vain upon the earth can be found in wisdom. We want to find out where we find this wisdom. Where does it come from? Look at Proverbs 8 with me. Proverbs chapter 8. Many different places in the Bible. Proverbs is full, full of this. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. And we'll start in verse 1 together. Who wrote Proverbs, by the way? Solomon. Solomon. Now, would you say, based on your understanding of Solomon, that there was nobody on the earth that had more riches than Solomon? Solomon was the richest man that ever or will ever live. All right? When it came to silver, they didn't even count it in his kingdom. He had so much of it, it wasn't even counted. You know, spoons and forks of gold and plates and all type of things. He, he didn't mess around with silver. Solomon was rich. But yet, when he understood where the true riches were found, this is where he began to write. And he would talk about the world and how all the things he had was just vanity. It would just pass away. It, it meant nothing compared to the word of God. Notice what your Bible says in Proverbs 8, verse 1. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the path. She crieth at the gates and at the entry of the city, at the coming in of the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. And I want you to know this is wisdom that's crying forth. Look with me, jump down to uh, verse 10. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Jump down with me to verse 18. Riches and honor are with me. Yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold. Yea, and my, than fine gold and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. But I might cause those that love me to inherit substance and to fill their treasures. All right, so notice the Bible is talking about wisdom and knowledge here and how it's better than any 
tangible uh, 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 treasures that we would have upon this earth. Look in chapter 16. Look in chapter 16. Look with me in verse 16. 16, 16. Proverbs 16, 16. There's so many of these types of, of scriptures and Proverbs. We'll, we'll look at this one, maybe one more, and then show you some other books. Look at Proverbs 16, 16. The Bible says, how much be better is it to get wisdom than what? Than gold and to get understanding rather than to be, than, than to be chosen, excuse me, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than what? Silver. Wisdom and understanding better than silver, better than gold. In the book of Proverbs 20, Proverbs 20, look at verse 15. Proverbs chapter uh, 20 and verse 15. Proverbs, what chapter are we going to? 20. And what verse? 15. The Bible says, There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. When the Bible is identifying wisdom and knowledge, truth. Nothing can be compared unto it. As a matter of fact, Job if you turn with me to the book of Job, Job says a few things about this. That's very, very interesting, very powerful scripture, Job 28. Look with me in Job 28. Job 28, we'll start together in verse uh, 12. Job 28, we're starting in verse 12 together. Here is Job, the man that uh, God uh, used as an example, saying that, have you considered my servant when he was talking to Lucifer? And how Lucifer was said, well, you know, he, he has so much. You know, he, he only worships you because of the things that you have blessed him with. Take those away. And let's see, we'll see him curse you to your face. And, of course, we know that Job never did that. Never did he sin with his mouth. Right? He was a man that uh, 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 was a pure man. He was a perfect man in his generation, the Bible says. One that feared God and eschewed evil. And notice what Job says in Job 28. Here was a man that had all things, richest man in the east, the Bible says. But notice what he says in verse 12. He says, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Men knoweth not the price thereof. Neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me. The sea saith, it is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Here is another man that the Bible identifies as filthy rich, yet identifies that everything I have cannot equal wisdom. Everything I have cannot equal truth and knowledge and understanding. As a matter of fact, you know this uh, scripture song in the book of uh, Psalms. Many of us know this scripture song, Psalms 19. Psalms 19. We might not even have to turn there, but Psalms 19, verse 7. All right, what does the Bible identify as better than gold, yea, than much fine gold? Notice what your Bible says. All right, notice what it says. Look in verse 7. So we're in Psalms 19. We're going to start in verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is what? Sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are what? True and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than what? Honey in the honeycomb, and he even talks about this liquid gold here. That's what honey is, liquid gold. And he says, listen, the fear of the Lord, 
or I should say the law of the Lord, the testimonies, his statutes, his commandments, the fear of God, his judgments are better than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Uh, David continues on in Psalms uh, 119. Longest chapter in the Bible dealing, dealing with the law and the statutes and the judgments and the testimonies and all of these wonderful things. But notice what it says in Psalms 119 and um, verse 27. Psalms 119, verse 27, it's reminiscent of what we just read in Psalms 19. The Bible says in Psalms 119 and verse 27, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Uh, elsewhere, he, he says it this way in uh, verse 72. In verse 72, he says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Um, look at verse 14 in Psalms 119. He says, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all what? Riches. So he's not just identifying here the law of God or, or uh, wisdom and knowledge or what we would say is the Bible. He's even saying the what? The testimonies. Now, if you take this through the scriptures, the testimonies are the words of the prophets. And that's why we as a Seventh-day Adventist understood that we have the testimonies for the church and the writings of the spirit of prophecy. And so those testimonies that we also have are greater than gold, yea, than much fine gold. God has given us an abundant treasure. What do you say? Look at how Paul says it in uh, the book of Philippians. Look at Philippians. Notice what your Bible says in Philippians chapter 3. So many places in Scripture that deal with the value of the Word of God. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, look with me in verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, we're looking together in verse 7. Paul, when he was describing, he's giving us testimony here. He's describing how he valued the truth as it is in Jesus. Look at what he says. He says in verse 7, But what things were gain unto me, those I counted loss for who? For Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but what? Dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul is saying, listen, all the things that I've had in life. You know, Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin council. He says that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. When it concerned the law of God, he was blameless, he said. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He identifies his, his value in the Hebrew economy. And he says, but all these things. They were, they were accounted but dung that I may win Christ. I value the law of God or the knowledge of God found in Christ Jesus above all the riches that I've ever possessed. Paul was not a poor man, by the way. When you understand him being a Pharisee and a part of the Sanhedrin council, these were not men that were low on the totem pole. This was a man of high stature and had great wealth, but he accounted it all but dung so that he can receive the law and knowledge of God. Now, in the book of Matthew, you can flip back there, Matthew 13. For those that maybe have just come in, we're talking about the parable of Matthew 13, verse 44. Let's read this again. Matthew 13, look with me in verse 44. Matthew 13 and verse 44. The Bible says in Matthew 13, 44, amen when you're there. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto what? Treasure what? 
hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So we're going to look at the first portion of this particular verse before the semicolon. All right, so the Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field. That's as far as we're going this morning. So far, the treasure that we've identified in Scripture is the Word of God. It's His law, His testimonies, His statutes. It's His commandments. It's the wisdom, it's the knowledge, the understanding as it's found in Christ. This is what we call the gospel. The gospel is much more than just Jesus on the cross. The gospel is much more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel, as a matter of fact, notice what uh, 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 Paul says in the book of Romans. Notice what he says the gospel was. Look at Romans 16. If any of the followers of Jesus preached the gospel, we can say that Brother Paul did. Wouldn't you agree? And so whenever Paul spoke, he was speaking the gospel. But notice what he says his gospel was. We're in Romans 16. Romans 16. That's what your Bible says, Romans uh, 16. The Bible says in verse 25, Romans 16 and verse 25, it says, Now to him that is of power to establish or to establish you according to my what? My gospel. So Paul is saying, listen, now unto him who is able to establish you. In other words, he's giving the, the, the glory to Christ and he's able to establish you according to my gospel. Now, what was Paul's gospel? Listen to what he says. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of what? Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. You ask most people what the gospel is, and they'll say it's the preaching of Jesus Christ or the preaching about Jesus Christ. But Paul is showing that separate to his gospel. He's showing you that his gospel is much more than that is found in what we would call the gospel. So notice what he says it is. He says, he says, now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of what? The mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. When you look at this in context, Paul is saying, my gospel is the mystery that has been revealed through the writings of the prophets. That is my gospel. You read in the spirit of prophecy, she says that Paul's gospel or Paul's message was established on the sure word of prophecy. And so when we're talking about the treasure and we're saying it's the gospel, it is the cross, yes. It is Jesus' life, yes. But it encompasses much more. It is the writings of the prophets. It is the mystery that was hid from ages and from generations but is made manifest or revealed through the secrets revealed to the prophets. And so this is the treasure, friends. Now, in the parable, it said that the treasure was what in the field? It was hid in the field. Did the man that find the treasure, did he hide it in the field? When you read that, it says that he found the treasure and he hideth it. But it wasn't him that hid it in the field. It's a different hiding there. We'll look at this next week. But it says he found a treasure that was already buried, right? What buries the treasure? What is this field, by the way, that contains the treasure? Let's talk about that first, and then we'll end off today on how the treasure becomes buried, or what buries the treasure. What buries knowledge? What buries truth? What buries the gospel? What buries wisdom? What buries this? We're going to look at these things today. Go with me to Colossians. Colossians. Look with me here. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Let's talk about what contains this treasure that's hidden, this hidden treasure. Look at Colossians 2 with me. We'll start together in verse 1. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look together in verse 1. Colossians, what chapter are we going to? 
chapter 2, verse 1, we know that truth, gospel, uh, uh, knowledge, wisdom, all these different words are the treasure. All right, what contains it? Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, For I would that ye know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are what? Hid all the what? Treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So where are the treasures hid? They're hid in God and in Christ. You might say, well, why are we saying that he's the field? Let's keep going. Look at what it says. Stay in Colossians um, chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look with me in verse 12. Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 12 together. We're going to see that in Christ, all the fullness dwells. In him, all of these grand truths are found. In him is hid the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Look with me in Colossians 1 verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, uh, 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 who, is, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should what? Some, a bit, no, all fullness dwell. The Bible shows in Christ all fullness dwells. In chapter 2, in him is contained the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that he might have the preeminence. Notice what it says in the book of Ephesians. Look at Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians, the third chapter. Look at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8 together. In the parable, the treasures, the hidden treasures, are found in the field. And so far, Paul is telling you that these treasures are found in Christ. Look at what it says here in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're looking in verse 8. The Bible says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace given, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, what? Riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of who? Of God, it says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in who? Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, these riches are found in Christ. But Jesus himself identifies himself by another name. Go with me to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We'll, we'll, we'll see that these are the very words of Christ as we read some in the handout that I gave you. Because it was Christ who spake through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam even to the closing scenes of time. So though they be not red letters, it's still the words of Christ. It's the words of God. So notice what it says here in John chapter 1. 
John chapter 1, looking in verse 1. In Christ is the hidden treasure. Paul makes that very clear. But notice what John says in John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And we read in Colossians and Ephesians that this is Christ. He is the one that has made all things. It says, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was what? Life. And the life was the light of men. And if you read in Desire of Ages, this was not life He received. The life in him was underived and unborrowed. You read this very clear in the spirit of prophecy. Look at verse 14. It says, and the word was made what? Was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Revelation 19, I believe it's verse 11. Let me give you the correct verse here. Revelation 19, yes, it's verse 11. In Revelation 19, verse 11, and you can read down to verse 16, where Christ, you see, is riding upon a white horse. This is the Him coming in glory and power. And the Bible says that His name is called the Word of God. The Bible says that He has a name that is written on, a, on His thigh, which is King of kings and Lord of lords. So Christ, friends, identifies Himself by another name. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom, yes or no? But Christ says, I am the Word of God. So in the Word of God are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. The things contained in this holy book are far more exceedingly wonderful than gold and silver and coral and rubies and sapphire and diamonds and, and pearls and all of the things, the topaz of Ethiopia even. That which is contained in this book is the greatest treasure and therefore the field is the word of God. And so what causes these things to be hidden in the field? What causes it to be buried? What causes this great experience? I want you to go into your, your handout. Go with me in your handout. We're going to read a few statements here. This, these next couple statements uh, deal with the truth as it is contained in Christ and his word. Notice what it says. This is Youth Instructor, June 28, 1894, paragraph 9. Notice what it says. It says, who is Christ? Who is he? He is the only begotten Son of the living, living God. He is to the Father as a word that expresses the thought, as a thought made audible. You've probably read in Desire of Ages where she says in the opening chapter that he is the thoughts of God made audible. All right, Christ is the thoughts of God made audible. That's why he's called the Word of God, right? It says Christ is the Word of God. Christ said to Philip, he that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. His words were the echo of God's words. Christ was the likeness of God, the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person. If men would learn to escape the corruptions that are in the world through lust, they must learn what the statement of Christ means when He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so friends, if you want to escape the corruptions of this world, how do you do it? How do you do it? It tells you right here. It says, if men would learn to escape the corruptions that are in the world through lust, they must learn what the statement of Christ means when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If we are to escape this world, it's through an understanding of this verse. Notice this next statement in Desire of Ages, page 390 to 391. The life of Christ, here we'll see that he, he identifies himself or, or connects himself with the word that cannot be separated. It says, the life of Christ was given, uh, uh, the life of Christ that gives life to the world is in his what? 
in his word. It was by his word that Jesus healed diseases and cast out demons. By his word, he stilled the sea. He stilled the sea and, and raised the dead. And the people bore witness that his word was with what? Was with power. It says, he spoke the word of God as he had spoken through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ. And the Savior desired to fix the faith of his followers on what? On the word. When his visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of power. Like their master, they were to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. As our physical life is sustained by food, so our spiritual life is sustained by the word of God. And every soul is to receive life from God's word, how? Himself. As we must eat for ourselves in order to receive nourishment, so must we receive the word for ourselves. We are not to obtain it merely through the medium of another man's or another's mind. We should carefully study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we may understand his word. We should take one verse and contemplate the mind on the task of ascertaining the thought which God has put in that verse for us. We should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own and we know what saith the Lord. In his promises and warnings, Jesus means me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that I, by believing in him, might not perish but have everlasting life. The experiences related in God's words are to be my, uh, are to be, uh, uh, my experiences. Prayer and promise, precept and warning are whose? Mine. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for who? For me. As faith thus receives and assimilates the principles of truth, they become a part of the being and the motive power of the life. The word of God received into the soul molds the thoughts and enters into the development of character. Friends, let's pause for a minute. Do you realize that there is no power in the promises of God unless they're made personal? I want you to realize that. You can quote all the promises you want, but if they are not taken as meaning for you, there's no power in them. You tie the hands of Christ. By our unbelief, we tie God's hands. We can have the mindset, yeah, I, I trust the promises of God, but are they, not, are they for me? I know they're for everybody else, but they're not for me. Therefore, there's no power in it. Because you have an experience. You are going through things. You're needing the promises of God. And if they're not personal, there's no power. There's no power in that. That's as if me praying just for other people and never praying for myself and agonizing with God for myself is like that's going to benefit me. I might be praying that God forgives your sins, but what about mine? I might be praying that God gives you wisdom, but what about me? It has to be personal. It says this, by looking constantly to Jesus with the eye of faith, we shall be strengthened. God will make the most precious revelations to his hungering, thirsting people. They will find that Christ is a what? personal Savior as they feed upon His Word, as they find, they find that it is spirit and life. The Word destroys the natural earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit becomes to the soul as a, comes to the soul as a comforter by the transforming agency of His grace. The image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature. Love takes the place of hatred. The heart receives the divine similitude. This is what it means to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is eating the bread that comes down from heaven. Remember when Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood? We talked about this last week. We talked about how we must take the flesh and eat it ourselves, the bread that comes down from heaven. 
When Christ was saying you have to eat it, he was not just speaking corporately. He's saying you have to eat it. You have to eat it individually or it's not going to give you life. The word of God is for you. The word of God is for me. The promises of God's word are about me. You know, I remember when I first started out in, in walking on the, the, the narrow way. I was told by a man of God, he said, listen, brother, when you read the promises of God, take out the, 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 the you's and the, and, the, and, and the ye's and all these things and put your name there. And so I did that. I was reading the promises of God and it made it so personal that God died for me. He loved me. He came to save me, my name. That's not a selfish thing. That's how he delivers his word to you. So the Bible shows us that life is in the word. Notice this next statement on the bottom of page one, Christ Object Lessons 107. It says, the Bible is God's great lesson book, his great educator. The foundation of all true science is contained in the Bible. Every branch of learning may be found by searching the word of God. And above all else, it contains the science of all sciences, which is the science of salvation. The Bible is the mine of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The true higher education is gained by studying and obeying the word of God. But when God's word is laid aside for books that do not lead to God and the kingdom of heaven, the education acquired is a perversion of the name. In other words, there's so many people that say, I have received higher education. But if that higher education did not come from God's word, that higher education that you say, or so-called higher education, is perverse. Every branch of learning, every science, everything is found in God's word. You understand? Remember when the three Hebrew, or actually it was the four worthies, were taken from the land of Judah and brought into Babylon. And there was much more that were taken captive. I'm speaking of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they were taken captive and brought into Babylon in, in, the, in their teenage years. The Bible shows that, you know, after their 10-day experience, they, they ate pulse and water. You know the story. The Bible says the king found them how many times great, uh, smarter, how many times better, 10 times better than all of the, uh, the Chaldeans, all of the wise men in his empire. And the Bible said God gave them skill, not in visions. That he gave to Daniel. But it says they, he gave them skill in all wisdom, in all knowledge, and in all learning. That means from the God's word they understood math. They understood sciences. What greater history than the history that tells you where you came from, how things began. They understood everything, animals and plants and everything from the word of God. Friends, this is the true knowledge and true education. This is where we receive wisdom and understanding. It says there is a wonderful truth in nature. There are wonderful truths in nature. The earth, the sea, the sky are full of truth, but they, they are our teachers. Nature utters her voice and lessons of heavenly wisdom and eternal truth, but fallen man will not understand. Sin has obscured his vision, and he cannot of himself interpret nature without placing it above who? God. Because of our sinful natures, friends, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, you have uh, Bill Nye the science guy, and, and uh, uh, you have all these, all these uh, 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 great minds, Smart men, but guess what they are? They're all atheists. And the reason being is because it's natural for man to place the truths that they learn from nature above the God of nature. And therefore, they focus on the creature more than the creator. And God becomes obscured. That doesn't mean that they are foolish and unlearned men. They just don't look through the eyes of faith. And that's what makes you an infidel. That's what makes you an atheist. But when you take off God, your, 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 your uh, human lenses, your human wisdom, and you put on God's eyes that he gives you by, your Holy, by his Holy Spirit, 
Then you can understand the truth. Listen to what it says. It says this. It says, But fallen man will not understand. Sin has obscured his vision, and he cannot of himself interpret nature without placing it above God. Correct lessons cannot impress the minds of those who reject the word of God. The teachings of nature is by them so perverted that it turns the mind away from the Creator. By many, man's wisdom is thought to be higher than the wisdom of the divine teacher, and God's lesson book is looked upon as old-fashioned, stale, and uninteresting. But by those who have been vivified by the Holy Spirit, it is not so regarded. They see the priceless treasure and would sell all to buy the field that contains it. Instead of books containing the suppositions of reputedly great authors, they choose the word of him who is the greatest author and the greatest teacher the world has ever known, who gave his life for us, that through him we might have everlasting life. The Bible shows, the spirit of prophecy shows, that the wisdom, the truths, the knowledge, the understanding is found in the Word of God. I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. So we want to just bring out some final thoughts from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. There's quite a few things. There's four pages of uh, uh, notes. We won't read all of them, of course. I want you to take this home and read it yourself. But we're going to go through the Bible. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What is it that buries the truth? What is it that hides the Word of God? Is it possible to have this book in your hands and not even know the truth? Is it possible to read it cover to cover and not find the gold? Is it, is it possible? Very possible. Such was the life of the Jewish nation. So possible that the Word of God in the flesh stood right before, him, before them and they knew him not. With all their wisdom and understanding of this book, they didn't know the truth. Let's look at what it says in 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to verse 1. When you're there with me, amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. It says, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestations of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be what? Hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The Bible shows here in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, listen, if our gospel is hid, it's hidden to those who are what? Lost. And how are they lost? Why, why is it hidden? It says the God of this world. Who is the God of this world? Satan has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Here they are having eyes to see, but they see not. They have ears to hear, but they hear not. They have hearts to understand, but they understand not, because the devil has blinded their minds because they choose not to believe. Things are hidden by unbelief. That's number one. You might want to make a note of that. Look with me in the book of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, it used to, I used to marvel how things that were so clearly seen by me in the scriptures, you would try to see, have other people see it and they just wouldn't see it and you would like labor with them, you would show it all different ways and it's just wouldn't see it. I was like, Lord, how is this possible? It's because of unbelief. When you choose not to believe, you won't. When you choose not to believe, you will not see. Or you'll have obscured vision and see something that's not there at all. Look at Matthew 11. Look at Matthew 11 with me. 
Here Christ is upbraiding, he's accusing, he's casting contempt upon the cities wherein his mighty works were done. Uh, notice what it says in verse 21. The Bible says in Matthew 11, verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe to thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, now, by the way, uh, uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida are, are cities in Galilee. Now, wasn't Galilee a, a, a place where Christ did an abundance of labor? He showed most of his miracles there, actually. But then he says, woe unto you, because of the things that I did and the truths that I taught were taught in Tyre and Sidon. And where was Tyre and Sidon? Those are the Gentiles. Those are the heathen, the idol worshipers. These, these devil worshipers. If I would have done the works there, he says, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For it, the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom. It would have been remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment then for what? Then for thee. And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from who? The wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Here Christ is casting contempt. He's casting these, these terrible, terrible words upon Chorazin and Bethsaida and, and Capernaum because of their high-mindedness. Here is another way we're going to see that truth is actually buried. When you're too smart for your own good, you're wise and you're prudent. You already know the truth. You don't need any more. Isn't that the epitome of the Laodicean experience? Rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So then couldn't it be said to Laodicea, Woe unto thee, if the things that I have done in them, uh, uh, in these other places would have been done in you, you would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But the reason why you have not been changed is because you refuse to see, because you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. The same experience that he is talking about Capernaum, the same things for Chorazin and Bethsaida, the same principle can apply to the church of God today. But you say, oh no, pastor, surely not our church, surely not Adventism. Certainly we, are, we don't have that experience. We, we are at the end of the world. We realize we have need of your truth, God. Not so. As a matter of fact, we're going to read some things, friends, that the very truths that were buried up and how the truths were buried up during the dark ages is the same thing happening now in the church. Wait a minute now. How was the truth buried up in the dark ages? How was the truth buried up in the dark ages? Who was the one ruling for 1260 years? Roman papalism, the Roman papacy, spiritual Babylon. And the things that took place then, that buried the truth then, are taking place today in Adventism. Now don't, don't. Go ahead of me and say, well, then the church is Babylon. No, the church is not Babylon. It's worse than Babylon. You read Ezekiel 16. The Bible says that all the other whores, all the other harlots, they're, 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 they're embarrassed by the things the church does. I've said this before, and it's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but I'll say it again. It is an insult to Babylon to call the church Babylon because we are worse than. You read Ezekiel 16. That's not, you read it. It's very clear. It's very clear there. Ezekiel 16, the whole chapter, it's probably one of the most vivid chapters in the language it chooses to describe the people of God that I have ever written or read, I should say, in all the Bible. Vivid words, very, very clear identification marks. Look at 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Unbelief buries the treasure. 
high-mindedness buries the treasure. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. The Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of who? The wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of who? The prudent. Remember those wise and prudent men that rejected the words of Christ back in his day we read in the book of Matthew? It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not who? God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He says the Jews, they require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom, but the preaching of Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Bible shows that God destroys the wisdom of this world by the truths contained in the cross, the gospel. The high and prudent minds can't see and understand these things. And that's why, friends, do you realize, I'm going to say this, uh, in the book Great Controversy, it's a wonderful uh, statement. It says that the mystery of the cross unlocks all other mysteries. That if we would understand the cross, if we would understand the gospel, if we would understand those things that even the surface reader can see, it unlocks all other mysteries. You know, my children and I, we have been, we've been having worship in the home and looking in Revelation 13 and studying the things about America and very, very appropriate for that which is taking place in the world today. And uh, the word of God has become so vivid now, so clear by that which is taking place in America that, you know, we were studying these things and it caused all of us to weep, caused us to see that we are living in the last remnants of time and that if it was ever a time to awake, now it is high time to awake out of sleep because now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. We were looking at these things and we were showing how the prophecies that relate to, 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 to the lamb-like beast and to the whore of Rome, how you can see that they are perfect parallels of the gospel, that the things that they do are the very things that Christ did. I mean, you know, I, I always use this example. And I've used this example before. Many of you have probably heard this. But if you look at how Jesus, from his birth to 30 years of age, he was in a period of 30 years of preparation. Then at his baptism, he began his ministry. He gave his power and testimony for three and a half years. And then he received his deadly wound. Isn't that right? And then he resurrects. And he, he, he describes this whole experience. He says, if I be lifted up, I'm going to what? Draw all men unto me. And then you look at the Antichrist. And how from the year 508, when the daily was taken away, to 538, there was a 30-year period of preparation. And then it gave its power and its testimony for three and a half prophetic years, 1,260 days. And then it dies. And then it says that the deadly wound would be healed and all the world would what? Wonder after the beast. Everything that Christ did in prophecy, the Antichrist does. It's a perfect parallel. So when you understand that the cross, and you understand the gospel, it is the mystery that unlocks all other mysteries. And so when people come to you with prophecy, or what they claim to be prophecy, all you have to do is square it up with Christ, who is the pattern man. And if it does not fit, then they have to quit. Right? If it doesn't fit, friends, then it's not true. The cross is the key. The cross is the key. It says in 1 Corinthians that the wisdom of this world, God made it foolishness. That by the wisdom of the world, I should say, by the world's wisdom, they knew not God. Notice what it says in the same book of the Bible, uh, chapter 2. Look with me in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. And then we're going to go to our paper and then we'll draw this to a close. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 14 with me. 
Bible says, what is the first word there? Three people with me. But, all right, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So, unbelief, human wisdom, and just being plain unconverted causes us to not see or understand the Word of God. These are things that would hide God's Word, hide these truths. Look at your paper. Look at your paper with me. We're on page 2. I want to read that Christ's object lesson statement there on page 104. And then you have Miller's Dream. And we won't read Miller's Dream, but I'm going to make references to it. You can read this on your own. And it's very important, friends, because I don't know of any other individual's visions or dreams recorded in the spirit of prophecy but Brother Miller's. So this, this vision here is a vision or a dream that he had that had so much significance. It was actually the Millerite story. It was the history of the Millerites in a dream. All right, but it, it, it means much. I want you to see with me in Christ's Object Lessons, page 104. It says, the treasures of the gospel are said to be hidden by those who are wise in their own estimation, who are puffed up by the teaching of vain philosophy. The beauty and power and mystery of the plan of redemption are not perceived. Many have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have intellect, but they discern not the hidden treasure. A man might pass over the place where treasure has been concealed. In dire necessity, he might sit down to rest at the foot of a tree, not knowing that the, of the riches hidden at its roots. So it was with the Jews. As a golden treasure, truth had been, uh, been entrusted to the Hebrew people. The Jewish economy bearing the signature of heaven had been instituted by Christ himself. In types and symbols, the great truths of redemption were, were veiled. Yet when Christ came, the Jews did not recognize him to whom all these symbols pointed. They had the word of God in their hands, but the traditions which had been handed down from generation to generation and the human interpretation of the scriptures hid from them the truth as it is in Jesus. The spiritual import of the sacred writings was lost. The treasure house of all knowledge was open to them, but they knew it not. God does not conceal his truth from men. By their own course of action, they make it obscure to themselves. Christ gave the Jewish people abundant evidence that he was the Messiah, but his teachings called for a decided change in their lives. They saw that if they received Christ, they must give up their cherished maxims and traditions, their selfish and godly practices. It required a sacrifice to receive changeless eternal truth. Therefore, it would not admit the most conclusive evidence. Therefore, they would not admit the most conclusive evidence that God would give to establish faith in Christ. They professed to believe the Old Testament scriptures, yet they refused to accept the testimony contained therein concerning Christ's life and character. They were afraid of being convicted, excuse me, convinced, lest they should be converted and be compelled to give up their preconceived opinions. You know, that's interesting because I've seen that firsthand where individuals will, will sidestep the most clear-cut truth because to accept it would bring conviction. And they would have to be convinced now that what you're saying is true. And if it's truth, they would have to change. And that's not just about people in the world. I'm talking about those in present truth. You can show things clear as day. They'll sidestep it lest they be convinced so that they be converted to these truths. It says the treasure of the gospel, the way, the truth, the life was among them, but they rejected the greatest gift that heaven could bestow. Among the chief rulers also many believed on him, we read, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They were convinced they believed Jesus to be the Son of God, but it was not in harmony with their ambitious desires to confess Him. They had not the faith that would have secured for them the heavenly treasure. They were seeking worldly treasure, and today men are eagerly seeking for earthly treasure. Their minds are filled with selfish, ambitious thoughts. For the sake of gaining worldly riches, honor, and power, 
they place the maxims, traditions, and requirements of men above the requirements of God. From them the treasures of this word, of his word, are hidden. Friends, the same thing the Jews did we do today. Many people will sidestep clear truth just so they can continue to practice the sins and errors in their life. And this is what causes truths to be hidden. You know, it's very interesting, this particular dream, Miller's dream on early writings, page 81 to 83, and you can read this on your own, but in this particular dream, he saw this casket, and in this casket were all sorts of beautiful jewels and diamonds and, and coins and, and wonderful treasures all laid out, you know, clearly in the casket. And he invited all type of people to come in and view the casket. And as they would come in and they would look at this casket and all the riches that it contained, they started troubling them and taking them out and, and trampling upon them and spilling them all over the place. And he began to, you know, try to get them out of the room, but there were so many people coming in that he couldn't, he couldn't get them all out. And at the end of this whole thing, all the casket was spilled over and these riches and the, 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 the gold and the silver and the, the, the diamonds and all these wonderful things were covered with dirt and shavings and, and, and sawdust and sand and all this refuse. And he began to weep. Because on his own, he couldn't pick them up and he couldn't put them back in the casket the way that they were laid out before. And then all of a sudden it says that a man came in the room that had a, a broom, a dirt brush, it says. And he begins to sweep the room and, and Miller, he goes to say, no, don't do it. You're going to disur disturb the, the jewels that are hidden beneath the rubbish. And the man tells him to fear not. He says, I have this. And he begins to sweep, and he sweeps all the dirt and the shavings and the sand and the rubbish out the window. He places the jewels and the treasures back in the casket. And when Miller looks at it, it says it shone much greater than before, much, much more brightness than before, that there were other things that he hadn't seen before. It was more beautiful, more glorious to behold. It says and when he saw this, he shouted for joy, and he did so in reality because his own shout awoke him. You ever do that in a dream where you yell out or you're fighting or something happened and you wake up and you're doing it for real or you, somebody else is in the room sleeping, and, right? And this was Miller. He gave a shout for joy and his shout awoke him. And he was glad for the dream because the dream represented the Millerite experience. And when the different Millerites, James White is one of them, you have this statement on page three. On page three, uh, James White writes in the present truth. In May of 1850, James White is writing about Miller's dream, and it's a long article. You, you, you can read this on your own, but we just took a, a few of the little excerpts out, and it says, the casket represents the great truths of the Bible relative to the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, which were given Brother Miller to publish to the world. The key attached, right, there was a key that would unlock the casket. You can read about it. It says, the key attached was his manner of interpreting the prophetic word comparing scripture with scripture. The Bible is its own interpreter. With this key, Brother Miller opened the casket or the great truths of the advent to the world. The dirt and shavings, sand and all manner of rubbish represent the various and numerous errors that have been brought in among second advent believers since the autumn of 1844. And so these truths that get buried up, they get buried up by rubbish and error. They get buried up by traditions, maxims, laws of men, church red tape. All these different things hinder the work. They bury the truth. You know, you'll, you'll be told, for an example, you'll be told, oh, hey, hey, listen, brother, you can't go and worship over there. You can't go over there. They're not under the umbrella of our organization. Don't go over there. And as a result, many people will heed that, that, that injunction, that, 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 that warning, and end up not hearing the truth anymore. Friends, listen, when Isaiah 58 tells you to break every yoke, you read about that in the spirit of prophecy, she's talking about that sort of stuff. Break every yoke. They tell you, you can't go there and worship there. You can't go support that ministry. You have to give your tithe and offering here. You have to do this, that, and the other. Break those yokes. Break them. She's very clear. Isaiah 58, that's the remedy for the disease of the church. 
And part of the problem of the church is we have so many human ideas, maxims, traditions, and and human understandings that the truth is buried. And people end up loving the organization more than they love the God that placed the organization upon the earth. The Bible and spirit of prophecy are clear in Signs of the Times. Page 3. We're almost done. Signs of the Times, May 1st, 1901. Listen to what it says. It says, Christ is the originator of all truth. By the work of the enemy, the precious gems of truth had been torn from their setting and placed in a framework of error. Christ came to replace the jewels of truth in their rightful position. He rescued them from the rubbish of error, gave them a new power, and bade them what? Stand Fast forever. He could use these truths with perfect freedom for he was their author. He had cast them into the minds of each generation and when he came to the world he vitalized and rearranged the truth which Satan had robbed of life. Clothing them with more than their original freshness and power he gave them to the world for the benefit of future generations. So notice who is the one that's clearing up and removing these truths from being buried. It's Christ himself. Listen to what it says in Review and Herald, June 4th, 1889, paragraph 12. In the time of the Savior, the Jews had so covered over the precious jewels of truth with the rubbish of tradition and fable that it was impossible to distinguish the true from the false. Listen to this. Don't don't miss the words. In the time of who? The Savior, the Jews had so covered over the precious jewels of truth that with the rubbish of tradition and fable that it was hard to distinguish, that it was impossible to distinguish the truth from the false. The Savior came to clear away the rubbish of superstition and long-cherished errors and to set the jewels of God's Word in the framework of truth. What would the Savior do if He should come to us now as He did to the Jews? He would have to do a what? Similar work in clearing away the rubbish of tradition and ceremony. And if he has to do a similar work, then we are walking in similar paths. And in the days of the Jews, the truth, it was impossible to distinguish it from error. So if he was to come today and he would have to do a similar work, what are God's people doing with the truth today? This is why the people of God and churches all over the world are confused. We are literally confused, friends on what the truth is. We have been taught, spoon-fed, that we are to receive the Word of God from the ideas and understandings of another man's thoughts and not study it for ourselves. And as a result, if they're in error, you're in error. How do you know if I'm telling you the truth? How do you know? How do the Bereans know that Paul taught the truth? That's right. They didn't say, oh, Brother Paul is here. Let's put the Bible away and just take notes and and we'll just go over them, you know, and and, and whatever Paul says, we're going to receive. They didn't do that. It said they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. In other words, let me vet Brother Paul. Let me see if he's telling the truth. They ate the Word of God for themselves. It says that Christ would have to do a similar work in clearing away the rubbish of tradition and ceremony. The Jews were greatly disturbed when he did this work. They had lost sight of the original truth of God, but Christ brought it again to view. It is our work. Whose work? It is our work to free the precious truths of God from superstition and error. What a work is committed to us in the gospel. That is our job, friends, to take the truths that have been buried and unbury them and and polish them off and put them in their original luster. That's our work. It says in Review and Herald, November 22. During the ages of apostasy, darkness covered the earth. Gross darkness, the people. But the Reformation aroused the inhabitants of the earth from their death-like slumber. So what was the ages of apostasy and darkness? That the Reformation, the 1260, right? The, The time period we know as the Dark Ages. It says, but the Reformation aroused the inhabitants of earth from her death-like slumber, and many turned away from their vanities and superstitions, from priests and penances to serve the living God. 
to search in his holy word, excuse me, to search in his holy word for truth as for hidden treasure. They began diligently to work the mine of truth to clear away the rubbish of human opinion that had buried up the precious jewels of life. On the back page, I just want to read a few sentences here. In volume 20 of manuscript releases, volume 20 of manuscript releases, 378. She talks about the ordeal of 1844, the disappointment, how it was very trying. She says, since that time, the people of God were exposed to temptation and received various errors as Bible truth. But then notice what it says. But I was shown that the Lord would, in his providence, clear away the rubbish of error and reveal to them the jewels of truth. These would be gladly received by many, and the harps that had been left untuned will be taken from the willows and again give forth sweet music. Many will discover the lost links in the chain of truth. They will see a beautiful harmony in the whole. Look into the next statement, volume one of manuscript releases 39. It says, mighty truths have been buried beneath the sophistry of error, but they will be found by who? The diligent searcher. Look at the next statement, pastoral ministry 68 to 69. I'm going to the latter portion of the first paragraph where it says precious rays of light. It's like the the third line up. It says, precious rays of light have been obscured by the clouds of error, but Christ is ready to sweep away the mists of error and superstition and to reveal to us the brightness of the Father's glory so that we shall say as did the disciples, did not our heart burn within us while we talked with, while he talked with us by the way. That which buries the truth, what causes the treasures to be hid? Error, tradition. Maxims, of, maxims or laws of men, superstition, pride, arrogancy, that big-headed wisdom that many people have, unbelief, unwillingness to search. Some of us will say, well, I don't have any of those things. I'm just lazy in study. And as a result, friends, you'll never find the truth. It's not on the surface because then you wouldn't appreciate it. When you found, I mean, think about it. If you found some gold and diamonds in the earth, what would you do to them? Would you leave them dirty and crusted over with earth? No, you'd wash them and polish them and have them appraised. You'd make sure that there was part of your choicest treasures. And that's what God wants to do or wants you to do with his word and the promises of scripture. I want to close in one last scripture. Last scripture in closing, 2 Corinthians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter uh, 3, I believe. 2 Corinthians. Yes, chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look with me. Verse 12. Paul is here speaking again. He says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in who? In Christ. But even unto this day, When Moses is read, the veil is upon what? It's upon their hearts. You know, this is speaking about the Jewish nation, but I've met many Christians even who they won't touch the Old Testament. They're not, that's the Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. Don't give me none of that old Moses. They don't see the freshness and beauty that's contained therein. You know, Jesus even says in John chapter 5, if they don't understand Moses' words, And how can they understand mine? For he wrote of me. So how can you understand the new if you don't understand the old? But here he's saying, listen, there's a veil upon their hearts. They can't see the truth. It's hidden to them because of the veil. And that veil is upon the heart. Now that's a principle I want to see uh, this, this morning before we close. Many times things are hidden because there is a veil. 
so that the glory of the gospel is not shown you clear because a veil is on your heart. How do I remove the veil? How do I get rid of it so I can see clear, so I can see the glory? It says in verse 17, or excuse me, 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord. What is the it that's going to turn to the Lord? No, that would be when he or when she. But it says this. Let's read in context again. Look at verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord. What is the it? The heart. When the heart is turned to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. The Bible shows us very clear that the treasures are the truths of his word. Those truths are found in his word. What hides it are traditions, maxims of men, superstitions, ideas and opinions, unwillingness to see the truth. All these things hide it. But then there's also another thing, while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed. One of the greatest things that hides the glory of the truth from men is their own heart. There is a veil upon the heart as you seek to want to see the truth or find the truth and you're finding it very difficult to see, it might be that that veil is not taken away. God is saying, listen, my son, my daughter, give me thine heart. Turn your heart to me so the veil can be removed that you might see my glory, that I can reveal the precious gems, the precious jewels, the small ones, the big ones, the ones like in Miller's dream that were not even bigger than the tip of a pinhead. All of them in their freshness and glory and vividness, God wants to show us. But the veil has to be taken away. The heart has to be turned to Jesus. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, there might be some here who say, Lord, of a truth I realize that I have kept back some of my heart. Yes, in my prayers and even in the prayers and speaking before my brethren, I have said that I've given Christ my heart, but I know different. I know that there is a smidgen that I've kept to myself. I know that I have not given 100%, maybe 99.5, but I haven't given 100%. There are things in my life that I haven't yielded to Jesus. There are things that you have been trying to convict me on for years and I felt the pleadings of the Spirit, but I've disregarded them because I knew if I identified, if I, if I identified with the things that you were showing me, if I was convinced in what you were showing me, I would have to be converted. I know there are things, Lord, but this morning I realize that the truth that I'm seeking is hid from me because of my own heart because of my own waywardness, my own ideas, my own pride, my own stubbornness, my own unwillingness to see the truth and act the truth out of my life. But today, Father, I want to give you an opportunity to take my heart from me, take it out of my hands, because it's your property. Take it out of my hands, cleanse it and keep it clean, because I cannot do it. This morning, I want you to save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self. I want you to mold me and fashion me and place me in a heavenly atmosphere where the love of God can flow through my soul. This is what I want this morning. I want the veil removed that I might see your glory. If this is your desire with me, I just want you to stand to your feet. Lord, as I stand before the congregation, saying that there are things that I too need to yield to my Savior. I stand with my brethren, realizing, dear Father, that we are living in a time and an hour in our history where we cannot play games and keep back 
portions of our souls from you. So this morning, Father, we stand giving you the okay, the green light to move in our life, to move in our families, our homes, to move in our church, to move so that we might move and be a movement in this community and in the world. Thank you, dear Father, for giving us an opportunity. And today, Father, may we make our call and election sure. In Jesus' name and blood we pray, and we commit our souls to your keeping. We place ourselves in your hand, and your promise is that no one can take us out of your hand. And we thank you for